You cannot sit in the jury box. <coughs> you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The defendant, Richard Alexander Murdoch, wishes to take the stand. Watch your step. Yes, ma'am. You'll place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right. You swear or affirm that the testimony you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, ma'am. Thank okay. you. You'll have a seat on the witness stand. Adjust that microphone. If you don't mind setting your full name again and spelling your last name. I'm Alec Murdoch, M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Mr. Murdoch, on June 7th, 2021, did you take this gun or any gun like it and shoot your son Paul in the chest in the feed room at your property off Moselle Road? No, I did not. Mr. Murdy, did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's brains out on June 7th or any day or any time? No, I did not. Mr. Murdy? Did you take a 300 blackout such as this and fire it into your wife Maggie's leg, torso, or any part of her body? No, I did not. Did you shoot a 300 blackout into her head, causing her death? Mr. Griffin, I didn't shoot my wife or my son any time, ever. Mr. Murdoch, is that you? On the kennel video at 8.44 p.m. on June 7th, the night Maddie, Maggie and Paul were murdered. It is. Were you, in fact, at the kennels at 8.44 p.m. on the night Maggie and Paul were murdered? I was. Did you lie to Sled Agent Owen and Deputy Laura Rutland on the night of June 7th and told them that you stayed at the house after dinner? I did lie to them. Did you lie to Agent Owen and Agent Croft on the follow-up interview on June 10th that the last time you saw Maggie and Paul was at dinner? I did lie to them. And in the interview of August 11th, did you tell Agent Owen and Agent Croft, did you lie to them t by telling them that you were not down at the kennels on that night? Yes. Alec, why did you lie to Agent Owen, Agent Croft, and Deputy Rutland about the last time you saw Maggie and Paul? As my addiction evolved over time, I would get in these situations or circumstances where I would get paranoid thinking. Uh, and it, it could be anything that, that triggered it. It might be a look somebody gave me. It might be a reaction somebody had to something I did. Um, it might be a policeman following me. In, in a car. Um, that night, June 7th, after finding Mags and Paul, 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 don't talk to anybody without Danny with you. All my partners were just repeatedly telling me that. I had a deputy sheriff taking gunshot tests from my hands. I'm sitting in a police car with David Owen asking me about my relationship with my wife and my son. And all those things coupled together after finding them 
coupled with my distrust for SLED, caused me to have paranoid thoughts. Normally, when these paranoid thoughts would hit me, I could take a deep breath real quick and just think about it, reason my way through it, and just get past it really quickly. On June the 7th, I wasn't thinking clearly. I don't think I was capable of reason. And I lied about being down there. And I'm so sorry that I did. I'm sorry to my son Buster. I'm sorry to Grandma and Papa T. I'm sorry to both of our families. Most of all, I'm sorry to Mags and Paul Paul. I would never intentionally do anything to hurt either one of them. Ever. Ever. Did, did you continue lying after that night? Did you not? But once I lied, I continued to lie, yes, sir. Why? You know, oh, what a tangled web we weave. But once I told a lie, I mean, I told my family, I, I had to keep lying. Alex, tell the jury what happened on the evening of June 7th, starting when you met up with Paul. <clears throat> I'd been at work that day, uh, a, a fairly normal day. Um, you mean start in the morning? or? Sure, start in the morning. Um, it was just a regular morning. Maggie was leaving to go out of town. Um, she was she was going to a doctor's appointment, and um, she had some stuff to do at Edista, where she was uh, having some work done on our house at Edista. Um, so, but Maggie was there that morning. Uh, she went to leave, and, and she told me she was doing these things. Um, I always always asked Maggie to come back home and stay with me. Um, but anyway, Maggie had left. She did her thing. Um, I went to work, did work. I learned from Paul Paul that... Who's Paul Paul? That's Paul, my son Paul Paul. My son Paul murdered. And, you, and, um, your, and your name for him was Paul Paul? Yeah, we, I mean, we called him Paul Paul. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. And um, I mean Buster, Maggie. I, I pretty I called him Paul Paul or Paul Terry, um, but Mags called him Paul Paul. Bus called him Paul Paul. Um, a lot of people called him Paul Paul. <clears throat> but anyway, I learned about the. I had known that CB, the guy that worked for us, had sprayed the sunflowers. I I, I knew about that, but I, I'd been out of town. Um, I didn't know they were dead. Paul let me know they had died. So we had to replant the dove field. That, that's how the dove field, which the, the, the dove field is just a big, it's a big social part of, 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 of having property. People would come and it's just a social big part of it. So the dove field was a big deal. So when, when the sunflowers got killed, Paul was, we knew they were dead, Paul was coming home. And I learned that early Monday morning. And did, um, 
and we'll we'll catch back up. But <clears throat> at some point in time, did you meet up with Paul? Yeah. After work, I met Paul Paul at the at the property. And and I and we're going to back Phil and talk about more of the day. But I just want to focus in on that evening right now. Okay. When Paul gets to the property, what do y'all do? First thing we do is we go to the Dove Field, and, and we and we look at the Dove Field and. Um, How did you get to the duck field? Uh, he had come in uh, my brother's truck. We got in my son Buster's black pickup truck. We called it Buster's truck or the black pickup truck. You've heard it called too. But I, I call it Buster's truck. Okay. So you're in Buster's truck and you, and you go to the duck field. Tell, tell the jury what else. Well, that's the first thing we do. We, we go to the duck field and we look. And it was clearly... It, it, it didn't. You could tell they were. I mean, you could tell they'd been sprayed, and you could tell they were dead. Uh, I mean, they might have still had a tiny bit of light, but they were dead. So we knew that. So we knew we had to replant the whole field. Um, so that didn't take but a second. Um, but after that, Paul, Paul, We just rode the property. We spent time together. We, we just we rode around and we spent time together on the property. Did you go to the duck pond? Oh yeah, we went. Uh, we went to several food plots. We went to um, single oak stand. We called it, which is across the road. Um, I know we went to the bridge stand. We went to the. Um, we went to the duck pond where we stayed for a minute and did you uh, I, I can remember the duck pond specifically because I had helped Paw Paw plant the dove field and, and uh, the corn in the dove field so sunflowers corn sunflowers corn and I had helped him plant the sun, the, the corn in the, in the duck field. Paw Paw had planted the duck pond by himself, and he's making a really big deal to me about how much better the corn was doing in the duck pond than it was in the duck field. But we stayed there for a little while. We rode. We were at the cabin for a little while. We rode around the cabin looking at it. No, cabin is what? That's... um. It's just a, a, a little small, it's, it's truly a cabin. It's a, it's a four-room uh, structure. It's, it's got a little living area, a little kitchen. It's got two little bedrooms and one little bathroom. And it's what you've heard talk about where the kids stayed some summers. And, um, and is that what the jury has seen from some overhead pictures? It's, it's right there on Moselle Road? Yeah, it's, it's, right, it's right up on Moselle Road, and, and it's very close to the... Um, the, the, the driveway that goes to the shop and the kennels. Did you spend any time at the shop, you think? Oh, yes. I mean, the shop was, I mean, that was sort of um, the hub. That, that was the main place. If you weren't at the house, you might be out going to a, this field or this food plot or this duck pond or, or, or this part of the, the river, but the, the, the shop is it, where the kennels were located, you know, that was, you were always there. Something was always going on there. You're always doing something there. That's where all the tools were. That's where all the equipment was kept. I mean, that was, that was the main hub. Right. And so we were there that day. I mean, there was a point in time where we unloaded the bulldozer that, um, that, that had been on a different part of the property. It was on a trailer. We lo unloaded it and sprayed it down real quick. That was just one of the many things we did that day. One of the things the jury's seen, um, Alec, is is a Snapchat video of you and, and doing something with a tree. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. I uh, and so what what was happening there? That's just part of when we were we were riding that that particular location where that was is at a food plot that that we called uh, Sawtooth Oaks, and it was named that because there was some Sawtooth Oaks that were planted there that you can't see in the, in the picture but uh, what that tree is at all these food plots there's an area where it, it, it's not as big as the field but it's like a field where you plant um, vegetation for 
for wildlife, like it might be cowpeas or soybeans, but you plant, and then there's a feeder to, to, to attract deer. Then we planted these little fruit trees on, on these stands, and what you see me doing is fooling with a fruit tree that I'd been tending to. It, it had fallen over. I had straps on it. I had strings on it that were holding it up. One of the strings popped. I undid the other string, and it was falling over, and Papa was laughing at me trying to get it back upright. And that was, it was just a fruit tree that I'd been dealing with for, really for years. And, and, and it wouldn't you, stand up straight. And were you and Paul having a good time at that point? You could not be around Paul Paul. You could not be around him and not have a good time. Were you were you close to Paul? You couldn't be any closer than Paul Paul and I and Buster and I were in our He's just a wonderful wonderful. And it's one of the things you enjoy doing together with just riding the property? I love doing anything with Paul Paul. It was an absolute delight. But yeah, one of the things, I mean, Paul's passion. I mean, Paul was passionate about a lot of things, but that property was really a passion of his. I mean, he loved to do, he loved to work it, he loved to work with fields, he loved to work with food plots, he loved to hunt. I mean, he he'd work on the roads. I mean, he would he would work on all of it. I mean, he would work on the structure. I mean, he would he he worked on the whole property. It was it was his passion. So on the evening of the seventh. I mean, the jury's been in, inundated with data from various different sources, but sure. just, just ballpark, can you, I mean, knowing you know, what we know now after reviewing everything, but roughly when do you remember Paul getting there and you getting there and starting to ride the property? Uh, now that I've had the benefit of, of, of seeing all of these records, um, Papa got home, I, I believe, a little bit before 7 o'clock. And I got home a little bit before him. I think the details had been that I got home around 6.42 or 6.45 or something like that. And Paul got there you know, very quickly thereafter, and then, by 7 o'clock. So you rode the property for a while. Um, do you remember uh, when Maggie arrived? Yeah, it was, uh, it was later than that. It was... Eight or after eight? I think it was after eight and looking at the records. A little bit after eight. And, and do, you remember, um, do you remember her arriving or where you were when she arrived? I believe that I was at the shop when, when she came through. Which would not be unusual for her having been away. Uh, if Blanca had gotten the mail or somebody had gotten the mail, maybe not. But if somebody had not gotten the mail, it would be perfectly normal for her to pull through there. And I believe she did pull through there that day. And, and Paul and I were at the shop, I believe. And then what, what did you do after Maggie arrived? Maggie went to the house, and I know that. Um, but shortly after, however I learned that Maggie got home, I went to the house when, when Maggie got home. And I left Paul at the shop. So, uh, and what did you do when you got to the house? I saw Mags, talked to Mags, um, and I took a shower. Um, the, the clothes that we saw in that Snapchat video was, uh, was that the clothes you had on, on, at work that day? Yes, that, those are the clothes I had on at work that day. And the, ju and the jury's seen you in, um, in those clothes, and, and what's, on, on June 7th, how tall were you and how much did you weigh? Um, on June seventh, well, I'm I'm six a little I'm a hair over six four, right at six four. On June the seventh, I was about two hundred and sixty five pounds, two sixty four, two sixty five. And um, and this was in June, uh, June seventh. Yes, sir. You know, when you're outside, riding around and doing some 
Do you get hot and sweaty? Absolutely. I mean, Paul and I have done some things. We 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 unloaded the bulldozer, cleaned the bulldozer, we fooled around. Yeah, I mean, I sweated. I was, you know, I was heavy and uh, taking prescription pills also makes you sweat worse, or at least taking oxycodone makes you sweat more than you normally do. So was it unusual for you to take a shower when you got back to the house? Not at all. And that, when you, after you took a shower, what did you change into? I changed into the clothes that you've seen in this trial, shorts and the shirt. When you got out of the shower um, and changed clothes, what did you do next? I went back out where Mags and Paw Paw were, and, uh, and what were for they dinner. Doing? What, what's uh, going on? Mags had, as you've heard, Blanca had prepared dinner, but uh, it had been cooked earlier. Mags had fixed. She, I know Mags had fixed mine and her plate because I didn't fix a plate. She may have fixed Paw Paw. Paw Paw was eating and Paw Paw was almost done eating by the time I got back out, which also wasn't unusual. I mean, Paw Paw was always on the go. I mean, he, he never sat still. And, you know, he'd sit down to eat, but then he's going on to his next item. And uh, So then Maggie and I ate. And do you all eat the table? Do you eat the den? What, what's your normal habit? Uh, we would do both, but, I mean, when we ate at the table, it was really sort of more f formal or, or, or not formal, but just more of an organized thing. Our normal, what we would normally do on a regular evening is we would eat in the den in front of the TV. And that's where we ate that day. I, I ate on the couch, the table. Maggie had a little... Um, uh, a TV tray that she kept over there, and, and, and Paw Paw would usually sit in a recliner and, and eat off of the ottoman. And was the TV on? Yes. Was that normal for the TV to be on? Yes. TV, if, if we were in the house, the TV was on. So what, what happened next, Alan? Uh, Paw Paw moved on doing whatever he was doing. I, I don't know if he was in the gun room doing something or he was in his room doing something. Or he was outside doing something. I, I actually thought he'd gone to the shed, but in looking at, to the shop, but in looking at the, the, the benefit of having these records um, that we have, I know he was still at the house or somewhere around the house doing something, but he wasn't in there with Maggie and I. Um, but. Uh, Maggie wanted to go to the kennels, and uh, I had eaten dinner. I laid back on the couch where I was sitting. Uh, Maggie wanted to go to the kennels, and she asked me to go. And and I didn't I didn't go at that time. I didn't want to go. Why um, Why didn't you want to go? Uh, it was hot. Um, I just had a shower. Uh, I knew I'd end up doing more work, uh, sweating more, and and and. The, the, the dogs is always a chaotic scene, and I just didn't want to go right then. Well, let me ask you, what, what had you done the, the previous days, like Friday and Saturday and Sunday? Um, start with Friday or yeah. go backwards? Yeah, yeah, start, start with Friday. All right, just, on just, that. Just briefly. So 7th, 6th, 5th, 4th. So June the 4th. Uh, my dad was in the hospital in Savannah, Georgia, at, at Memorial Hospital. And I went down uh, to visit him Friday afternoon, and I stayed with him in the hospital. I, I spent the night there, you know. He was real sick. I mean, he was having a hard time. Um, Did you get much sleep Friday night? No, I mean, I had a... They, a, a a real sweet nurse found me. At first, there was just a hard chair in there like this, but a, a nurse found me a soft chair, sort of like a recliner. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure I slept, but I didn't sleep. You know, I, I didn't get a night's sleep, no, sir. And then Saturday and Sunday? Um, Saturday, uh, we had plans with um, 
with um, Buster in Brooklyn. Y'all have heard about Brooklyn. It's Buster's wonderful little girlfriend. And Mags and I had plans with them to meet them in Columbia to go to the uh, South Carolina. Uh, it was a regional baseball tournament. And South Carolina was playing Virginia, I believe. So when I got back from Savannah and, and, and met up with Mags, at some point we, we, we headed to Columbia. So, I mean, there wasn't a lot going on in between there. We headed up to Columbia and met Bus in Brooklyn. And then and you stay, did you stay in Columbia Saturday night? We did. We went to the ball game. And I remember it was an evening game. Um, we, we went pretty early and tailgated. Maggie had, Maggie had reconnected with a college friend um, who coincidentally had married a college friend of mine. Um, and they had a son that played for Carolina. He was a first baseman uh, and a really good little player. And we met them and tailgated with them. And, and, it, and it was a lot of fun. They had a lot of the, the parents of the players that um, were playing for Carolina. And uh, it was just, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a fun time. We tailgated and then we went to, and it was a night game. So we went to the game and the game got over. Um, you know, it was fairly late into the evening. And after that, Bus, and Brooklyn, and Mags and I uh, believe we went to the restaurant in the hotel where we were staying, but we went and had dinner and, 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 and then Bus and Brooklyn went home and, of course, Maggie and I went to our room. And then... Get up the next day, and there another game. Another game the next day. Um, that's right. And, uh, and then you, after that, you head back to Moselle with Maggie. Yeah, we went to the game. Um, that's right. Mags and I go back to um, Moselle. To Moselle. And the jury's heard about. I think Ms. Rass talking about you bringing Krispy Kreme donuts to your dad. Maggie loved. Her. She, she spoiled my dad and always I mean, always taking him something my dad loved sweets and, and she and I picked up donuts and took uh, Krispy Kreme donuts uh, to him and then um, y'all both spent the night together at, at Moselle on Sunday night did you both spend the night at Moselle on Sunday night yes and then the seventh was a work day that's right. It's a Monday, Monday, June the seventh. Hang, hang on, hang on. I'll, I'll rephrase it. Oh, was, I'm sorry. Was Monday the seventh a work day for you? Yes. Okay. And and I just wanted to give that background. And so moving forward to when you testified previously about Maggie asking you to go to the kennels, were you tired? Oh yes, I was tired. And you had just had a shower. Just had a shower. And um, and you said that, well, did you go with Maggie to the kennels no. immediately? No, I did not. What did you do? What did she leave? Yes, she did. She left and Paw Paw was gone. Do you know how she got to the kennel? At the time I didn't, but now looking at these condensed records um, and, and, and understanding the timeline, it's clear to me that she rode with Paw Paw. And uh, and did you stay in the house? Yes. For how long? Not long. I laid back on the couch, put my feet up, and like many times when Maggie asked me to do something that I didn't want to do or didn't start out doing, I changed my mind and decided I'm going to ride up there. And I did. And how, how did you get to the, to the kennels? I went on a golf cart. <coughs> um, was it was the golf cart at the house, the main house? Yeah, it was, and it was there most of the time. And when you got down to the kennels, what was happening? Uh, it's just what I thought it was. Um, it, it was a little bit of chaos. I mean, it was clear to me that uh, Max had just let the dogs out. Um, the two dogs that were out were really her 
pet dogs. One is Grady. You've heard about a black lab. That's Grady. That's Buster's dog. And the other is the yellow lab that you've heard about. That's Bubba. Uh, Bubba was mine and Maggie's dog, but it was really mine, Maggie's, Bus, and Pawpaw's dog. It was a family dog. Um, but Bubba's the dog I hunted. Um, I mean, Maggie loved Bubba. She loved Grady too, but I mean, she had a special place for Bubba. But anyway, when the dogs first were let out, the first thing they would do is they would run. You, you, if you look at the overhead um, picture that you've seen, there were planted pines right behind the kennels. So you got the kennels and the, and, and the chicken coop sort of form an L shape. And in, in that L was some planted pines. First thing the dogs would do is go out in that um, kennel and, you know, Bubba and, 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 and Grady, I think, learned this from Bubba, but Grady would do it too. But Bubba had to mark every tree. I mean, he, he, he would go and he'd do a little number on this tree and that tree. You know how dogs do, and this marking his territory. Um, and, and so that was the first thing those dogs did when they came out. When I got there, those dogs were in that area. So that's why I believe that it hadn't been long before they'd been let out. Um, Grady was chasing guineas, um, which was a normal thing to do. What, what are guineas? Uh, guinea fowl is, a, a guinea fowl is like, um, it's like a chicken, it's a domestic bird that, you know, we had them, I, they make a lot of racket. It's like, a, you know, I know this sounds silly, but it's like a, a guard bird. Um, because anytime, you know, they just make a lot of racket anytime anything unusual is going on. If anything, if anything disturbs them, it could be a person, it could be somebody driving up, whatever, they're going to make a lot of racket. So um, Grady's chasing the guineas. Um, you know, Paul's fooling with um, Rogan's dog, Cash. Um, Maggie's just kind of standing there watching the dogs, which is normal. And, and they were in that place. As, as the dogs are out longer, they branch out more. Um, but at that point in time, they were, they were right there. So that told me they hadn't been out um, a long time. Bubba, Bubba catches a chicken. Um, I'm talking to Maggie for just you know, a short time before Bubba catches a chicken. I take the chicken put it when Bubba Bubba didn't chase these dogs didn't chase the chickens to kill them and they didn't normally kill them they did kill them sometimes but it was about the chase with those dogs and 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 they were proud when they caught one you could just tell by the way Bubba would prance to you when he brought the chicken to you he was proud that he had caught it but he wasn't trying to kill it and so most times the chicken wasn't dead and that chicken wasn't dead um, but a lot of times they would be stunned and they would be just real lethargic. So you had to take the chicken and you had to put it up somewhere where, you know, the chicken could be by itself for a minute and, and it would eventually, usually, you know, come back to normal and go on about its, you know, whatever a chicken does. Did, did you get the chicken out of Bubba's mouth? I did. I took the chicken from Bubba and I put it... Um, on, on top of that, now, now we've seen you know this video of Paul um, with Cash Rogan's dog. Did you know? Did you know that was going on? What, what do you remember about that? About yeah, I, I knew Paul was. I knew Paul was fooling with. Um, when I pulled up on the golf cart, Maggie was standing back, sort of where the driveway would be. Um, it, it sort of runs out at the feed room, um, the storage rooms, what we call it, it's been called the feed room. Um, but it sort of ran out. Maggie was a little bit further up where she could see back in that angle where the dogs were. Paul was fooling with um, Rogan's dog back towards the kennel. If I remember when I first got there, Paul was more in the driveway. But then I knew Paul was in the kennel fooling with cash, yes. But did I know what he was doing? I didn't know exactly what he was doing. No. Did um, you? I knew he was fooling with his. I knew he was fooling with his tail. Well, was was Cash in the kennel when when you 
pulled up, you think? Not when I first got there. Okay. Um, did Bubba or Grady have any uh, collars on? Yes. Which, both dogs, one dog, do you remember? I don't know about Grady, but I know Bubba had on his, what we call a tracking collar. Paul, for his hunting dogs, um, Paul had a system, a series of tracking collars. And I think there were five, it might have been six, but it's a tracking collar um, that had a, a device that would tell you where that collar was. So that, was, Bubba was bad about you know, he would, he would stay close for a minute, but then he would take off. And he especially do that on Maggie. He would, he would take off and run. Um, and so he had on a tracking collar that if he did that, you could, you know, you, you could know, okay, he's, you know, a half a mile down here. It, it's not going to follow him but so far, but it would follow a good long distance. So you could go get the dog um, if he ran off, which Bubba frequently would do, especially when it was just Mags and Bubba. Um, and so Paul, Paul probably would have been the one to put that on Bubba. So you've got us where you've gotten the chicken out of Bubba's mouth and put it up on a doghouse or something? I believe, I believe what I put it on, and I don't remember this, but I've seen pictures and all this and I saw the chicken sitting on top of the um, what looks to me like a portable dog crate whatever wherever it was sitting on there is where I would have put it up there you know mm -hmm. any reason to believe anybody else moved that chicken and it ultimately that chicken did die and um, what did you do after you got the chicken out of Bubba's mouth I got out of there I, 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 I left I went back to the house all right well look, before we do that um, We've seen the dog kennel video with Cash and, and Mr. Davis, and we slowed it down for him. Do you see the water hose in that video on the ground? Do you remember seeing that? Uh, yes, I do. Was the water hose out? And Obviously, um, in the video, but can I, I don't specifically remember that, but I can look in that video and see it. Right. But that's not something that I noticed. So, but you've seen it in the video here. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. And then the two dogs were out. Absolutely. Bubba and Grady. Okay. And then you, you head back. How did you get back to the house? The same route. I mean, the same route I'd come on. I came down the driveway, made a left on, uh, you, you saw my route um, in the car. I, made, I, I drove that same route question was obviously wasn't clear enough what were you in a vehicle you walk had, what mode of transportation did you use to get back to the house same way I came I went back in the golf cart and, and it is the golf cart if you remember that Mark Ball <coughs> testified that he saw where we normally would park it you pull up pull along the, the, the front entrance and it either you come in from the left and you'd go just past it and be on the right or you'd come in from the right and you'd be just past it on the left and that's where I got in it and that's where I put it back did you do anything else um, before leaving after you took the chicken out of Bubba's mouth no we've heard about Bubba being stubborn how long did it take you to get chicken out of Bubba's mouth well Bubba could be stubborn but Bubba would listen to me and uh, and, and, and another thing, when Bubba had on that collar, one of the other features of that collar was... What did Bubba have on the collar or was it Grady? Bubba had on the collar. Bubba had the collar. Bub, I know Bubba had a collar on, and I'm not sure about Grady. Okay, go if, ahead. If I'm I sorry. misspoke on that, there's no question about it. Bubba had on a collar. I assume Grady did too, um, but, but I didn't, I, I didn't, even though I saw Grady, I didn't notice for a fact that Grady had on the collar. Okay. But he probably did. So. Makes sense did, to me that he did. How long did it take to get the chickens out of, no, the chicken out of Bubba's mouth? It didn't take, it didn't take long. Number one, Bubba's coming back there to show me, hey, I caught this chicken. So he's not running from me. He's proud of that fact that he caught this chicken. So, I mean, he's, he comes right up to me. Um, Bubba was really strong, uh, but you know, you just 
you, you take your thumb when the dog's clenched and his mouth's a little bit open, all you do is you take your thumb and you push his gum in really tight against those sharp teeth and his mouth opens right up. Took the chicken out and put it on, I believe, left. the portable dog kennel. And then left. And then I left. Then leave, okay. And did you go back to the house? I went straight back to the house, to the air conditioner. And what did you do when you got back to the house? I lay down on the couch. And then what? Well, I mean, was TV on when you went back? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the TV never got cut off. So you went back to the house, you lay down on the couch, and then what happened next? I'm not, uh, I'm not positive I dozed off for a minute or didn't doze off for a minute, but uh, I got up off of the couch, uh, and I, was, I, I made up my mind I was going to visit my mom. Had you spoken to Barbara Mixon earlier in the day? I did. And I talked to Barbara most days. If I didn't see her, I talked to her. And what was your understanding of, of your mother's uh, condition on late on the afternoon of the 7th. She was agitated, which she got agitated uh, when my dad, you know, I mean, we were putting my dad in the hospital. I mean, he had a lot, uh, over the 18 months, two years, I mean, my dad was in the hospital. He was in the hospital a lot. And my mom, I, b I believe my mom knew when my dad wasn't there because, I mean, she would get agitated. I mean, that's just the only term you can think of. She'd get agitated. She'd, she'd, she'd cry a lot. She'd, um, she'd be fussy when she normally wouldn't be fussy. Uh, I mean, she was, I know Alzheimer's patients are unpredictable, but I'm convinced she knew because it happened frequently. And Barbara Ann told me, your mom's agitated. You need to check on her. I gave her medicine. She's resting. Um, so it wasn't anything urgent. Um, but she's resting. So what, what Barbara would do, and Barbara could handle her, Barbara could handle her better than, I mean, my mama, we all love Barbara. My mama loved Barbara. My mama could get, I mean, Barbara could get my mom to do things that nobody else when she fussed for anybody else, including me or my brothers or my sisters, Barbara could get her, you know, in, in, in order. And, uh, but Barbara had given her medicine and, and to, to settle her down and calm her down. And, and that would sometimes make her go to sleep for a little while. But then she'd be agitated when she woke up. The, um, so did you go check on your mom? I did. Um, did um, where did you park when you got there? In the, you you saw the pictures. There's two exits off of that um, deck. One of them to the right. One of them straight out that back door. I would have parked to the left. If, if you if you're coming down these steps, if, if these are the steps, it would be to the left and back over there. All right. Um, which is where. I always parked, or where we always parked, anytime you were going in that entrance. All right, I'm, I'm going to stop there and um, ask Doug if you don't mind pulling up State's Exhibit 524, which is the GM OnStar data, and it's a slide 38, um, which is in evidence. Can, can you? Can you see this uh, the slide with those dots? Yes, sir. Alec? I can. I can. Red dots here at the um, that are, seem to be joined. Where, where is that in relation to your parents' house? Where the arrow is? Yes, sir. All right. That's back in the area where I'm talking about. All right. So if you look in this picture, all right. You see the you, you you see the open area with the green grass. That's the that's the front door. Okay, yeah, right right where that circle is. That's the front door. The, it, if you look at closely at the house, you can see a big dormer right in the middle of the roof. 
That's right over the front door. The white thing to the left of the house, that's like a parking pad where the, where the driveway ends. And there's a parking pad. That, like, so you go to, if you follow the driveway all the way to the house, you're going to run straight into a carport. All right? By the, by the carport door. Just to the left before you get to the carport is this area that you can see here. That's, that's part driveway, mainly parking pad. All right, I'm going to, um, Doug, if you'll pull up Defendant's Exhibit 130, which is in evidence, please, sir. Yeah. And, and from this photo, can you point out roughly where, where you normally, where you park that evening? All right, this is, the, this is the entrance to the right that I'm talking about. There's an exit and an entrance. Uh, right in front of that door that you see there. So if you came down those steps, walk to your left, would be down there would be where I parked. Oh, would you, would you have parked on the grass? Uh, you get on the edge of the grass back there. There's there's some grass there for sure, but it's not it's not the area up here by the house where it's sodded and sure. this this grass that you can really see in this picture. So. It, it may be on the edge of the grass, yes. In, in, in relation to the satellite dish, um, are you looking at this photo, are you to the right of that? Yeah, you'd be to the right of that satellite dish. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and I believe was, that satellite dish is right on the edge of the, um, you know, there's a, there's a hedge and like you, you see the, I don't know what you call it, a border, like a, a border where the grass ends and the flower bed or whatever it is starts right I think you can't see it but I think that satellites probably close to that border all right well let's um so it'd be to the let's right of that in this picture Doug uh, we pull up a defendants exhibit 134 see if this is a <coughs> so yeah. is, is the door that you're talking about yeah. that's uh, it the, the stairs that are those the ones where you would enter Right. That these are the steps that I used that night that we always used. And, and one of the reasons being is my dad, this, this door goes into what we call the breakfast room. The breakfast room leads right into the kitchen. And so straight through this door, all of the breakfast room is kind of to the left. That door goes straight through another door way. There's no door there, but it's like a, just an opening. It goes into the kitchen. Immediately to your right of that entrance into the kitchen is the entrance into where my mom and dad's rooms were. So you, if you went through that door, you were in a little area that had my mom's closet, my dad's closet. Um, a little bit further, you go into my mom's bedroom. If you went to the right, you would go... My, my dad and my mom didn't sleep in the same room at this point, but their bedrooms were, you know, they were back to back. There was a door going from one to the other that was blocked, but it was there, and then there was a bathroom. So this is really, this is really the part of the house that at their age was getting used. So that's why you went in this entrance, because my mom and whoever was caring for her was always in her bedroom which would be just on the other side of the room that has these windows that you see to the right. All right, that, those would be the windows for the room where my dad slept. Right. And then my mom's right on the other side. The kitchen's right there. This is the part of the house they were always in. And, and are you the only one that would pull up in the back like that? No. Is it common for your brothers and your sister to do the same? Oh, we all did it. I mean, we all... We all park in the, in the same way. If you knew you were going to the front of the house or if you knew there was a crowd there or for whatever, you, you may park on the driveway, but if you knew under normal circumstances, my dad always stayed in the breakfast room where he had a recliner and a TV. That's where my dad always was. My dad never, you would never go catch him sitting in the den up front or in a in a living room, he, he he just wasn't up there. He was in this room 
watching TV, or either he was on this back deck. And my mom was either in her room, which was just off of that, or she might be in the kitchen. Or, or the breakfast room. And when you got to the house, who was there? Your mother's house on the night of June 7th. My mom was there, and Shelly Smith was there. And, and what did you do when you got there? Uh, the first thing I did was I tried to, I tried to, I knocked on the door. The door was locked. I knocked on the door. Shelly didn't hear me. And then what did you do next? I called. Called what? I called my mom's house to let Shelly know I was there. Please come let me in. Okay. And, and is that the house phone that's been referred to? Yes. Okay. And did she let you in? Sure. And then what happened next? I went in and I visited with my mom. I mean, you want me to go into detail on that? Well, just briefly. Yeah, what did you do? I, I went in the house. In my mom's bedroom, my mom had a bed that was where she slept in normal times. It, it was like, uh, you know, a bed with, um, you know, the poles coming out of the corner, a poster bed that um, coming out of the corners. And she had a bed like that, that where she slept, but she didn't sleep there anymore. So, but it was in the room. It was a hospital bed. So when you, when you walked in the room, her bed was to the right. Against the wall to the left was a hospital bed, like a single bed, um, but a hospital bed and a TV. And then there was a recliner where whoever was helping her would, would usually sit. So I, I went in. And I sat down on my mom's hospital bed. And I just talked to her for a minute. My mom was awake. And I held her hand. And What kind of condition was she in? Uh, she was, I mean, her condition was not good at, at any time. But given her overall condition, she seemed to be doing pretty well. I mean, she wasn't agitated like I thought she would be, or like I was worried she would be, or like Barbara had described her at that point. So she, she wasn't agitated. And, uh, you know, I just talked to her. Any, anytime we talked to my mom, we always tried to be real positive and, um, you know, upbeat and just, and, and I, I just talked to her. You know, I just talked to her, made sure she was okay. Um, did, did you stay seated on the side of her hospital-style bed, or, or did you move around? I, I mean, I stayed there for a few minutes, uh, you know. I stayed there and I talked to her uh, more than just a few seconds. Right. And then, but, but I didn't stay there. Um, she was, uh, she, she did look tired. Um, so I, I got up and I went and I... I think I sat on my mom's bed for a minute to start with, and then I lay down on my mom's bed, which is, you know, that's what I, I normally did when I went in there. There, there. there wasn't like a lot of chairs to sit in, um, and I just laid back on the bed. Now, when talked you talk to Shelly, and we watched TV. Now, when you're talking about your mom's bed, are you referring to her regular bed? That's right. Okay. Not, not her hospital bed, not the bed she was in, but her, her bed, the one I was talking about with, like, posts. Right. Um, the um, let me uh, skip something. Um, was Maggie planning to go over to your mother's with you that night? No, she wasn't planning to go with me that night. Okay. No, was in fact, Maggie didn't really like to visit my mom. Um, it was, she loved to visit my dad, and, and she loved to spend time with my dad. And she spent a lot of time with my mom when my mom was healthy. But, you know, I mean, by this point, my mom, and she was a shell. And she was a shell of her old self. And... I mean, it was kind of. I mean, it was kind of sad to go and visit her anytime. I mean, she she just she wasn't healthy, and and Maggie didn't like to go 
and just visit my mom. When when you when you left Moselle to ha- head to Almeida um, the evening after you had gone back to the house at Moselle, what Say that again, Jim? What, what exit did you use of the Moselle property when you're going to Almeida on the evening of June 7th? I went out the main gates, which would be straight ahead. The, um, you've heard of the two gates. There's the, there's the shop entrance. Um, there's actually several entrances, but the main ones we used, there was an entrance by the Dove Field, there was an entrance further down by Sawtooth Oaks, but the main ones we used were the shop entrance and what we call the main entrance where the brick gates were. Did, did you go, why, why didn't you go by the kennels on your way out? There, there wasn't a reason to go by the kennels at that point, and I was going to Almeida, which that the main gate would be the, the gates that were closer. Did you notify Maggie uh, in some form that you were leaving to go to uh, see your mom? I tried to call her. And and did she answer? No. And what did you do after that? I think I tried to call her again. And... Did she answer? No, she didn't answer. And at some point, I texted her after that. Well, the fact that she didn't answer on two times, um, did that concern you? At that time, right. it didn't concern me at all. Number one, she was with Paul. Paul. So, no, I mean... Number two, I mean, it's, it's not unusual to not be able to get somebody all the time when they're at the house or they're it's on the property. I mean, you've heard all the testimony about how spotty cell service was. So, no, at the time, it didn't strike me as anything unusual. Okay. Now, moving back to Al- Almeida, you spent time with your mother and then then you left to head, head back to Moselle, is that correct? That's correct. Did you, drive, did you drive straight back to Moselle? I did. Now, Alec, there's some um, information from the telemetry data off your Suburban and perhaps some of this OnStar G- GPS data that indicates that at some point in time in your mother's driveway, you stopped for about a minute. Do you recall seeing that data? I did. What were you doing when you stopped? Do I, was you getting, I was getting my phone. That uh, I, I, my phone had gotten. There was a console in the middle of my car, and my phone had gotten down in the console between the console and the seat where you couldn't get to it. Okay. Were you during that minute or however long it was? Were you disposing of murder weapons, Alan? No. Were you disposing of bloody clothes? No. And your your ride back to uh, Moselle was it? Uh, were you driving faster than normal? Normal? I was driving however I drive, normal way that I drive. When you got back to the Moselle property, how did you enter the property? What entrance did you use? Came right back through the main gate. And what did you do then? Went straight to the house. And when you got to the house, what did you do? I went inside. Were lights on when you pulled up? Lights were on in the house for sure. I can't remember if there were floodlights on or not. I, I, I don't believe there were any floodlights on, but there were definitely lights. All, all, the, 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 all the lights in the house were on, yes. And when you, um, how long did you stay inside the house, roughly? Uh, now that I've seen the benefit of, of these records, I was in there several minutes. 
obviously, I mean, were you surprised that Paul and Maggie had not made it back to the house? You know, I don't know if surprised is the right word, but, I mean, I, I would have, I, I thought they would have been back by then. Right. You know, but, I mean, did it cause me to go into any, it wasn't like I was shocked. But, I mean, I thought they would be there. I mean, I, I distinctly remember, uh, uh, you know, I, I went and looked. Sometimes I was very hot-natured. Number one, I was hot. I was heavy, and I was taking pills. So I was always hot. Maggie was always cold. Sometimes she would watch TV. We had a TV in the um, hunting room. You, you see on the wall there. Sometimes Maggie would be in there watching TV where she could have the thermostat different than we always kept it cold in the in the main part of the house. So I know I, I, I know I went in there and, and, and looked in there for her. Uh, it's not unusual for Maggie to be taking a bath and be uh, not able to hear me, so I went back there and, and, and I, I know I did those two things and, and, and looked in those two places. And they weren't there. And so, you know, I, I knew they'd been at the kennels and I assumed they were still up there. So, what'd you do? I went to the kennels. I may have tried to call them. In, in fact, I probably did try to call them. We, I, I would think I called them. Um, but as I sit here right now, I'm not positive, but I would think I did. would think I tried to call them to see. And now, like, when you, did you drive down to the kennels in your suburban? I did. What would you see? I saw what y'all have seen pictures of. So bad. I went to um, Did you see them on the ground when you're pulling up in your Suburban? I did. And what did you do when you came to a stop, Alec? I think I jumped out of my car. I'm not exactly sure what I did, but no, I got out of my car. I know I ran back to my car, called 911. I was on, I called 911. I was on the phone with 911 and I was trying to tend to Paul Paul. I was trying to tend to Maggie. And I just went back and forth between them. Were you um, going to Paul and Maggie while you were on the phone with the um, 911 operators? Yes. Okay. Yes. And in, a, in a little bit, I'm going to play the 911 tape, but I just want to ask you, and, and you've told law enforcement that has been played here in the court, um, did you, what did you do when you went up to Paul at some point in time?
involved. Oh, Paul was so he was so bad. At some point, I know. I, I mean, I know I tried to check him for a pulse. Um, I know I tried to turn him over. When you say you tried to turn him over, what? Why were you trying to turn him over? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why I tried to turn him over. Me and my boys lay face down. And he's done the way he's done. His head was the way his head was. I could see his could see his brain laying on the sidewalk. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I, I just I got, tried to turn him over. So I grabbed him by the belt loop. I try to turn him over. <clears throat> and when I did, his phone popped out. I mean, his phone popped out. And I just picked it up and I put it right back there. Do you have any idea how it popped out? I mean, I know it came out of his pocket when I pulled on his belt loop. When I, when I pulled him to, to turn him over. And it just popped out. And I mean, it popped right beside him. It sat right beside him. Were you were you able to turn Paul at all? I mean, I I, I didn't. I don't know if I was able to. I didn't turn him over. No. 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 What what side of the um, what side of Paul were, were you when you were doing this? I was on. Um, I was on the side that was away from. I was on the side that was away from where my car was. Okay. I mean, I, What'd you do with the phone? I put it back on Paul. Paul. <laughs> You know if you put it, you know which way it was pointing, upside down, downside, any way? I couldn't tell you anything about it. I know his phone popped out, I picked it up, and I put it back on him. Did you see any messages on Paul's phone? No. Did you go to Maggie? I did. Did you touch her? I did. Where where did you touch Maggie? I think I touched her down just around like I don't know. I don't know. If you if you ask me exactly, I, I think I touched her down around her waist, but I don't know. It was so bad. Excuse me. I, mean, um, I know I went back and forth. I mean, I went back and forth between them. I know. I know I did. I'd, I'd like to play Doug. Um, uh, the Colleton County portion of the 911 call, the which is in evidence as defendant's exhibit number nine. And, and Doug, this is the long version, the, the, the first clip, and stop it when I say stop it, please. 2021, 22 hours, seven minutes, nine seconds. I'm still here, okay? Connor County Communications. President, I have an Alex Murdoch on the line calling from 4147 Mobile Road. He's advising that his wife and child was shot. Okay, and sir, give me the address again. Well, it's 
47. Moselle Road, I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. <laughs> How do they shoot? Alan, when you, when you say, I've been up to it now and it's bad, what are you referring to? I'm talking about what I saw is what y'all saw pictures of. And I mean, it was bad. It was terrible. And, and when I first got there, um, I know I got out of the car. Um... And I mean, I know I I got out of the car. I mean, I knew. <sighs> got out of the car, but I, right at first, I don't, I don't, I didn't go. I don't think I'm. I went all the way to them. I think I ran back in in. in and and that's when I called nine one one, and so I called nine one one. And while I was doing that, then is when I went to Maggie, and I went to Paul, and so that's what I think I'm talking about. Okay. Thank you. Keep going, please. say the word here what are you calling anybody or anything no I'm talking to that dispatcher and, and what did you mean when you said here if you listen to that call one of the first things she asked me one of the first things she asked me was did they sh shoot themselves and I knew, knew, there's no way. I mean, it, I knew they didn't shoot themselves. It, just, it, just, it wasn't a gun. They didn't shoot themselves. And she'd asked me that. And then she asked me another question, something about that. And you hear me say here, and then you hear the thing talking. I'm telling her here, and then I say something. And then you hear me say, if that's what you're asking. And I'm letting her know they didn't shoot themselves. I'm saying here, and then I give her an explanation, which you can't hear on that phone, but it's obvious to me what I'm doing. And I say, if that's what you're asking me. So, like David Owens asked me on August 11th, did I call a dog or was I talking to somebody? There was no dog that was out. And there was nobody there. Well, let's, let's talk about that briefly. Well, when you got there and you saw Maggie and Paul, what? where were the dogs? The dogs were in the kennels. They were, yeah, dogs were in the kennels. They were wherever they were when law enforcement got there. 
and, and you've seen pictures, and they called Dell Davis to the stand and talk about the hose rolled up. Did, did you roll the hose up? No. Did you do anything down there at the kennels when you got there other than call 911 and attend to Maggie and Paul? Um, no, I, I, I do know that I, I, I was trying to find a flashlight. I was trying to find a gun. Um, other than those things, no, I didn't, do, I didn't do anything at the kennel. I didn't do anything with any hose. I didn't do anything with any dogs. Was there anybody with you? No. All right, keep going, please. Okay, is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. Okay, and what is your name? My name is Alex Murdoch. Okay, did you hear anything or did you come home and find out? I've been gone. I I just came back. Okay, and was anyone else supposed to be at your house? No, ma'am. Please hurry. We're getting somebody out there to you. Oh, man. Oh, I know. Alec, we just heard you say, I should have known. What are you referring to? I said, Paul, Paul, I should have known. What were you referring to? I was referring to Paul, Paul got so many threats. <laughs> Didn't take serious. Think twice about. So I'm just telling him, Paul, Paul, I should have known. I won't specifically remember saying that, but I can clearly hear myself say that. Okay. What what kind of threats did you understand Paul was receiving? I mean, Paul got. He got the most vile threats. I mean, the stuff that was on social media. I mean, it was... I mean, you, you couldn't believe it. You couldn't believe it. It was so over the top. Truthfully, we didn't think anything about it. I mean, it was just so crazy that, you know, we just... I mean... People talking about what he was going to get and how they were going to do this and get him and I mean it's it's stuff you really I mean you, you we we disregarded it because so over the top thought it's so over the top. Keep going, please. Uh -huh. time you saw them and you said an hour and a half to two hours ago and then she followed up two hours ago you just heard that I did hear that um, and I said approximately to right. her question when was the last time you saw them Maggie and Paul right after I took the chicken from Bubba and the the video we've seen is timestamp 8:44 uh, p.m. 
Is that correct? That's right. So was it shortly after 844? It was. And It uh, wasn't long after that. Because you can hear when Bubba gets the chicken, and it wasn't long after I took the chicken from him that I left. And then you called 911. Uh, the records of that, but do you remember roughly 907 or right before 907? I mean, I've seen the records and seen the um, transcripts, yeah. And then this is... And the records of this, but this is some minutes into the conversation with 911 operators, correct? That's right. Like, uh, knowing everything we know now, I mean, was it roughly an hour and a half the last time you saw them? It was. That would, with, with the time of how long it took to get to this point, how many minutes that is, is 10, 10, 10, how, however many, you can look exactly and see what point this is and know what time it is, but it's between 10 and 10 15. And so. I'd seen them around 8.45, a little bit after. Okay. All right, please keep going. Hey, what they were doing at all? <laughs> no, I talked to her in person. You talked to her in person? And please hurry. <laughs> Did you go back to the house and get a gun? I did. And is this the gun that, that you got? And how did you load this gun? What I mean, what did you load it with, if anything? <clears throat> that was gun, as best I can remember, I believe I got that gun off the pool table where you heard there was some other gun. I think that gun was laying with that pool table. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure it was on that pool table. It would have been the first place I came to. I know I was grabbing the first gun I could get. I grabbed a handful of shells out of the um, that I could get my hands on. I know the I know the gun had a shell in it um, that I loaded, and I I know I had a few shells. So. Hey. Have you seen in this case where there was a 16-gauge shell put in that gun? I've seen in the records and I've seen and heard in the testimony that I put a 16-gauge shell in the gun. Is that a 16-gauge shotgun? It's not a 16-gauge shotgun. It's a Why'd you put gauge. a 16-gauge shell in it? I obviously didn't realize what I was doing. I mean, I know you can't put a 16-gauge shell in a 12-gauge gun and not... I mean, I've been hunting my whole life. I know you can't do that. That's that's not a mistake I would have made. That's not a mistake I'd have made under any circumstances other than that night. Why did you go back to the house to get a gun? I just didn't know. I didn't know. I mean, you know. Oh, it be? I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, I, I didn't know if somebody was still out there. I don't know. I guess I, I didn't know. Okay. Please keep going. <clears throat> Not 
Um, go, go back to where he, he said he's going to my house to get a gun, just, just a few seconds back, 10 seconds maybe. I know you're upset, Mr. Murdoch, but I, I don't want you to get a gun and, and have a gun out whenever my officers get there, okay? Back up some more. Back up some more, please. I have just to get a gun just in case. <laughs> what is your telephone number? 942-1227. I'm going back to my house just to get a gun just in case. I'm about 100 yards to my house. <clears throat> Al, you said you're about 100 yards from the house? That's what I said. Is it much further than that? I mean, as you've heard in the testimony, it's 1,100 and something feet, but... Okay. I said I was 100 yards. You, you, were, you were wrong about your estimate? I'm sure I was wrong. Okay. Keep going. And does anything look out of place? Ma'am, not, not particularly, really, no ma'am. Okay. Well, I know you're upset, Mr. Murdoch, but I, I don't want you to get a gun and, and have a gun out whenever my officers get there, okay? I will not do that. He's been being threatened by... My son had a book back. He's been doing it for months and months and months. He's been hit several times, and he should finally quit. Do you know who was threatening your son? It's too many. Can I? Hold the phone. One second. to the um, the next tape of the same call. 2021, 22 hours, 13 minutes, 58 seconds.
No, I like that second clip starts at 22, 13, 10, 13, 58, and, and, and you're asked, don't, I mean, you're told don't touch them. How, how do you touch them by then? Yes. And that way you told the 911 operator? It is. And um, I mean, can, can you say exactly during that six, seven minutes when you actually touched them? I know I touched Maggie. Um, I touched Maggie several times, but I, mean, I, I think I didn't. I don't think I touched Papa, but two times. Did you touch? Uh, one or both of them before you got in the car and drove back to the house? Yes. Yeah. One or, or both? You know? Both. Both. All right, keep going, please. Okay. Well, I, I just don't want you to move anything just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? Informed the 911 operator that that Paul had made reports of these threats. What, what are you referring to? Uh, I mean, I, I just know that it had been reported. I, I don't know that. I mean, I don't believe there was any like formal police reports or um, that type of thing. But I mean, it, it had been reported, and I mean, it was it was well known. So were you saying he had filed some official report when you said yes? No, I never thought. I never. I never thought there was a police report or some formal report like that. No. Do you know whether or not he made some type of report at, on campus? At, oh, I know he did. And what, what do you know? I mean, I know that there was a there was a time when he went to he was asked to come meet with um God, I can't even remember the gentleman's name now but I appreciated it so much and I never thought I'd forget it but Is it part of student counseling service yeah he was the dean of students um right. but anyway he reached out to Paul Paul and wanted to talk to him and um I mean, at first we were concerned, you know, why did they, why did they want to talk to him? And, I mean, even, I believe I had Paul come talk to you about that because we were concerned, well, what are they going to talk to him about? But when Paul and Jim got there, it turns out that it was really just, I mean, they were wanting to make sure he was okay. Would you know? Just it, it, make sure he was okay, and I know that you know they were aware of the threats uh, or, or some level of threats, and so yeah, I mean it had already been reported to them. Okay. Keep going, Doc. Okay. All right. 
<laughs> Whatever you say, then put your gun up for me, okay? Okay. Okay. Well, how old is your son? Twenty-two. Okay. All right. We're we're getting them out there to you, okay? So, Alec, um, did you call family after you got off the call with, now on the, with the operator? Yes. Who did you call? I know I called my brother Randy. Um, I know I called my brother John. And I know I tried to call Roro. Well, Roro's not family, but I called Randy and John. And I, yeah, I and called then, Randy and John. And then you just mentioned Roto? Ro -ro, Ro -ro, Ro Rogan. We call him Ro -ro. I called him Roro. Why did you try to call Rogan? Um, I mean, Rogan. Rogan's house was like. I don't know, as the crow flies, maybe two and a half miles, three miles. Um, I mean, Rogan was like family. Did you think he was the closest person? Yeah, I just wanted somebody. I wanted somebody to be out there. Had you seen Rogan's name on Paul's phone in any, any way that night? No. You called. Um, did Rogan answer? No. Did you try, try multiple times? I, at, looking at these records, I believe that I did. But I believe some of those are um, like the FaceTime calls that are to Rogan. I mean, I'm trying to call him, but I don't believe that was me, actually. I, mean, I, I didn't FaceTime. I mean, I didn't FaceTime people. So that, I, I think that's... Either me trying to call him and hitting FaceTime, or that's me hitting um, <coughs> buttons or hitting the phone. In the um, state's exhibit 519, which is the condensed timeline done by uh, Agent R Rudofsky, there's an indication, to Alec, that at 10:2209, you opened a group text message from Michael Gunn stating. She brought the heat for Miami boys. Were you reading text messages from Michael Gunn right after you got off with the 911 operator? I heard them ask that question. I can promise you I wasn't reading any text messages. There's also an entry, Alec, that says at 10.40 p.m. that you did a Google search or a Safari browser search for Whaley's at Edisto while your wife and son are laying dead on the ground. Did you do that? No. Whaley's is a restaurant at Edisto that we ate at a lot of times. We got takeout from a lot of times. So I'm assuming it was in my search history pulling up the restaurant. And I obviously was trying to call people or dialing, and I, I hit that. I wasn't doing any Google searches. And is one of the persons that you dialed that night a, a wedding photographer? Uh, it's a guy named Brian White. I saw that on the call log. Brian White's a guy who was in my, um, what do you call it, um, contacts that is a, um, a, a videographer that I've used in cases. I haven't used him in two years. And he's a good guy, but we're not personal friends, so I certainly wasn't calling him. So were you, what, what does that indicate to you that those actions on your phone, what, how do you account for that? They were, obviously they're unintentional. I mean, I'm doing something with my phone trying to call people, but I'm not trying to call those people. I'm not doing a Google search for any Whaley's restaurant, and I'm certainly not reading any text. I'll ask you, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to go to the jury room for a break of about 10 minutes. Please do not discuss the case. You'll stay put, Mr. Miller.
We'll take a 10-minute recess and step down. It's not special testimony.